Welcome. If you are like me, you are now terrified thoroughly. <sighs> uh, I am Julie Jordan. I am West Coast Senior Writer for People Magazine. And I am honored to moderate this panel today as much as I can try and stomach what we just saw. But I'm anxious to see um, and get the perspective of the cast and let you guys really get a sense of what it was like to make this film. So with fur no further ado, Please help me welcome to the stage, first, Noah Emmerich, who plays Jerry Jacks. <laughs> I think that one closest to you, yeah. And then second, please welcome William Cunningham. <laughs> Either or. And we didn't rehearse this. We didn't rehearse. They're just coming in. <laughs> and the lovely Julian Amarkalis. There you go. All right, everybody situated and settled. Okay, so I was just saying to the audience, this was absolutely horrifying, at least in terms to absorb and watch. Um, the fact that it's a true story is even takes it to a new level of um, terror. So for each of you, first of all, as actors, when you get projects offered to you, and of course, the obvious is it's a good script. But aside from the script, for each of you, what was the moment you said, I have to be a part of this? Uh, for me, it was when they said there was going to be a Juliana. <laughs> you know what's funny? I was at home and I told my wife and my daughter, I may have told you this, I don't know, uh, and I said, I've been offered this thing, and I said, who's in it? And I said, uh, Juliana Margulies. Before I got to the end of the sentence, they said, you're doing it. <laughs> Though I didn't have any choice in the matter. When I heard she was in it, I was doing it. <laughs> That's very sweet, and I would say the same, except you weren't on board yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I was so thrilled when you both were. Uh, for me, it was... Um, reading the first four episodes and realizing I knew nothing about, I was just completely ignorant of what had happened in 1989 on US soil and I was ignorant of the fact that it is a global issue and I thought it would be a great way. I wish I was a scientist or had a scientific mind. I'd be doing something much more worthy with my life, I'm sure. But my only contribution is that I can shed a spotlight on what I think is a very important issue. Okay, so in a, a roles like this, especially when you're playing a real person, which obviously is different from a, um, a character that a writer has created, how, how important it is, is it to really hone in on that real person? I know you didn't meet um, your character, you didn't meet Jax before you did the production. You talked after, or you talked, no, but we you talked. met. I, yes. We talked and emailed before. Uh, she was in, She lives in Kansas, and she was in the middle of moving. So um, it was hard. And also, it was a pretty quick process. Right. Yes, I'm doing it. You have three weeks. Go. So <laughs> it wasn't. Um, but I talked to her on the phone for about an hour uh, and picked her brain, um, asked, trying to ask her intelligent questions, and then I at the end, I said, and now can I ask you stupid actor questions? Like, what shoes did you wear in the lab? <laughs> and, and what, what, you were on an army base, you're a colonel in the army, were you in the lab in your, in your skirt and uniform? Or, you know, things like that. And she's like, never, never, never wore those pumps. I always wore combat boots. I, so I got to understand a little bit of her character and who she was as Nancy outside of the lab. Um, so that's, that was as much as I got, and, and the writing. I mean, I, Richard Preston, who wrote the book, um, got a lot of his information from the Jaxes themselves. So what's in the book and what's in the script is true stuff. And um, the most important thing for me was getting their blessing. I didn't want to make a show without them saying yes to the book and the script. And um, all they've been with us every step of the way. I also think that you know, in a case like this where they are real people, but no one knows really who they are or how they walk or how they talk or what they look like. So there's thus of a demand to do an impersonation of their physicality, yeah. I think, than in the case of people that everybody knows. So when you're playing a character that everybody knows how they walk and talk and what they look like, yeah. there's a call to do that. But in this case, I think it was more important for us to capture the, the truth of the character's motivations and their actions, but actually doing a physical uh, adjustment to, to emulate who they were actually. It wasn't, wasn't, wasn't called for. Liam, what was your prep like? 
Well, it was fine because my guy's not real. I know, but I mean, how did you prepare? Did you do any research? Um, well, I did. Um, well, I, I wanted to find out what it, the motivations, and, and uh, it's like Noah says, your responsibility is to the truth of the story and delivering it and, and, and attempting to suspend an audience's disbelief. Mimicry is, a, is trickery. Um, and uh, so it, it, uh, when, I, when I look at something like that, I, I just I, I look for holes. I look, my BS meter goes up, and, and, and I look for that stuff. And if I can't find anything glaring, I look for it in details. And, and the more I reduce or get rid of that stuff and that un, uh, unsureness in me, the more I, I believe the character and the more I can tro throw into making them as real as I can possibly do it. So, so um, there, was, there was obviously procedural stuff and with the stuff with the silts <laughs> that we didn't like too much and we needed to know how to do them properly. <laughs> That was fun, <laughs> not. Uh, so that was the only kind of preparation I did, and there was uh, obviously some bit for, for for procedural stuff when we were in Africa. Uh, we wanted to try and get that right, but character-wise, I just kind of um, do what do I believe this this guy, and do I believe that their relationships, um, and and if that rings through, uh, it rings true. Um, it, I I can do the job. Okay, and I'm going to make you repeat yourself a, a little bit because you've said some good things along the way. We know that you have said medical jargon is very hard as an actor. What, do you have a tip? Do you have a, is, are there, are there the things you've learned to help you memorize and, and really remember, especially when you're not necessarily understanding the words that your character is saying? Yeah, I think, I think if you ask any actor, medical jargon is the hardest of all because um, the, it, there's no through line in what you're saying. You you don't really know what you're saying and you certainly don't have the time to look up every single thing that you're saying and even if you did you still wouldn't understand it. It's not a regular thing that we incorporate into our lives. But something I learned on this and I'm gonna and I am going to take it to my next job. So Nancy Jacks has monologues, pages. Um, on screen it doesn't look like it but it's pages of monologues of just gibberish to me. <laughs> um, where I stand up in front of all these guys and I, I mean it was like on, on the script it was four pages and in the lab when you're saying words like immunofluorescence that doesn't flow off the tongue and you're in a hazmat suit which by the way um, aside from finding out I was highly claustrophobic um, <laughs> There are uh, fans to keep it circulate, air circulating. So when you when they zip you in, suddenly you're just hearing, which try writing with a jackhammer outside your window. It's the same thing. You can't think straight. And you can't hear your cues. And you can't hear. I mean, there's one. There was one shot of me. They had to. We had to reshoot it because I do it. I did it right. And then I'm waiting for Topher to say his line, and I'm like, and you see me go. <laughs> <laughs> And the direct, my, Michael Uppendahl, he goes, uh, we can see you, <laughs> like, right on camera. But you feel a little, um, you feel isolated. You, you, you're not part of the planet in those suits. You're somewhere else. So I found a trick, which was, and I'm so glad I was in a hotel and not at home with a family around me. In order to learn these lines, I realized I had to spread them out all over the pages, all over my hotel room and start doing things while saying them. Usually I learn lines sitting down, preferably in bed. So, you know, you try and think maybe they'll just go in my head <laughs> if I put the script here and fall asleep. <laughs> but with this kind of dialogue, you have to understand you're also doing something and you're distracted by the noise all the time. So I learned my lines walking around my hotel room, opening a can of Coke while I was saying immunofluorescence, biohazard level four, blah, 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 you know, and then going to the next thing and taking a pen and, you know, constantly moving, that was the only trick I could come up with to learning lines, otherwise you get distracted and they're gone because they're not part of your natural dialogue ever. And, and also there was that horrible thing when, when I, I know that we were both like that at the same time when we put the hoods on and t so your fellow actor could hear you, you're shouting right. so that they can hear you but the thing is because you've got a hood on you're actually shouting at yourself <laughs> as well it's the most weird isn't it it's absolutely horrific and you're going this is the worst acting i've ever done in my life i'm just shouting at myself through a plastic hood and, and then between that you're like that <laughs> trying to hear the other person shouting in their hood it was really I, weird i remember when you and i were running down we were running down the hallway in the in the um the 
Tyvek oh, yeah, suits, right. and and James Darcy's character comes into the into the hallway to stop us, and my line was get out of the way, I'm Colonel Nancy Jacks. And of course I can't hear anything because there's a fan and I'm, and I'm yelling it. And they bring me into ADR and they're like, so you were yelling this line? We thought maybe you could just say the line. And I look, I was like, of course I'm yelling the line. I can't hear a fucking thing. <laughs> <laughs> and neither can he, I'm in plastic. <laughs> but the mics were right here. So it was a very fine line. So they were picking up us yelling at each other the whole time. <laughs> No that's the thing where you need to be. Uh, but that's when you need to be professional. <laughs> it's not. It's not inspirational. It's not coming from some from the vapor somewhere. It's got how the hell do we do this and not look like dicks? It's. Uh, isn't it? Isn't it? It really is. Yeah, and it's tough because you don't know how to deliver the line. Do you live, deliver it for reality, which is the whole the whole show would be like, get me the scissors, okay? And like no one wants to watch that. But do you deliver it like the person can hear you? So for the audience, it sounds like natural conversation, but they can't. You're actually just going. <laughs> it was, yeah. So aside from those moments of yelling at yourself, um, when. Especially if your friends, your loved ones, when they say, oh, you just did that, what was it like? Like, when you think back to the production, what was the moment that stayed with you that best describes the experience for you? For me, oh, sorry. Uh, well, for me, it was, it was Africa. Uh, when we, when the, the production design did an incredible job on the, on the African village, and when we went in there, and then I was introduced to, uh, I don't know if you, if you, Meet, met him yet the old faith healer guy i don't think he's shown up um and he was from one of those villages in the congo when the ebola thing broke out and he's this o older um uh congolese guy who's incredibly um gentle and speaks like about eight languages and and um and he's a rural man and, and to be in that guy's presence and to, to just feel the bond from when we were doing the military stuff and the laboratory stuff, to see this guy from this little village who, in our story, without giving too much away, he makes an incredible sacrifice. Uh, and, and those kind of things that brought it alive and humanized a very scientific and academic thing that this uh, Ebola outbreak was. I'm not following that. <laughs> I didn't get to no, go to Africa. I. <laughs> Actually, to be honest, that's why I stopped. I remember, uh, weirdly, I think what comes to mind is my very first night, very first day on set, I, like Juliana said, it was, a, it was pretty quick between the job uh, and, and shooting. And uh, my very first day on set, I had not, we hadn't spoken, we hadn't met, and it was a scene where I'm waiting for Juliana outside. She's been in quarantine. I think it's in the first, or, you just saw it, where I'm waiting for her and I go, let's go home. And she's like, no, I got to go back in there and we got to do this. I'm like, why you? You know, you have kids and are for us. And so it's a pretty deep uh, scene, relationship-based scene. And we hadn't met or spoken and I landed and we went to the set and like, hi, nice to meet you. And we shot the scene. And I'd obviously been a fan, and as I mentioned in the beginning, but you know, once when we shot that scene, I was like, this is just going to work. Like, this is going to work. Like. We hadn't rehearsed, we hadn't spoken, but we were all of a sudden husband and wife in the middle of sort of a, a crisis moment in their, in their lives. And it felt like, oh right, I got a great dance partner, which is why I came here in the first place. So it felt, I, I, that comes to my mind. Yeah, there, it was, I have to say, I'm, uh, I had been working at home for eight years in New York City and, and leaving the set and going to, home to my wonderful family every night. So this was the first time in 10 years, I had been on location. And um, for me, aside from the fact that I think it's an important story to shed light on, so, the, so that maybe one out of four million people who watch it will say, I want to be a scientist. I want to figure this out. For me, it was the nights we all, actors are so lucky in that we get put in these situations, and I forgot how much I missed it where when you're sitting waiting for them to light and it's two in the morning, we're all in a room together finding out about who we are and, and chit-chatting and making jokes and you know yelling out a line and saying, what movie's that from? And being among your peers on a set in the middle of nowhere, um, it's why I think I love acting so much even though I don't want to be away from home, but I had missed that. I had missed the camaraderie of that and the closeness that you get to complete people who are strangers three weeks prior 
And then you know you're going to know them for the rest of your life. I mean, that's the life of an actor, if you're lucky enough to get great actors with you. Um, I'm sure there's been shows where we're all like, oh, and goodbye. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that, it, it was a really, and, and, and Topher and, and Robert Sean Leonard, and, and we weren't, it wasn't like we were sitting in some luxury hotel somewhere. We were like, we were in shitholes, and, in, and it was freezing. <laughs> But we had our heaters and we, you know, one of us would go and get us like tea and we'd sit and chit chat and I, I really value that. I think, I, I always think I'm so lucky that I do what I do. Well, on that note, and aside from when you first meet and your first scenes together, uh, what would you say, if you think back to the production, what moment were you most impressed with your co-stars, with each other? I'll, I'll, I'll go first. If, since obviously they're having a very hard time. They're just shy. We're shy. They're thinking. They have We're lots shy. of options. So We're and so many. Uh, it's a, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna pick up um, where Noah left off in terms of um, it was that first night because it is what was great is the acknowledgement. Um, obviously, we both had, had admired each other's work before, so it was a it was lovely to be in each other's company and I was excited to have him as my partner but we immediately said okay so this is weird we are husband and wife okay so we've been married <laughs> you know 15 years <laughs> and we've never met before but you know what we met and and Noah said you know I don't want this guy coming off because it was a very fine line for Jerry's care for Noah's character playing Jerry Jacks to come off a little whiny you know to sort of and if you read the scene on the page it sounded a little bit misogynistic. But when we did the scene, and he made it all about him just caring about her well-being, it had nothing to do with sexism. It had nothing to do with, I don't believe you can do this. It was truly about the love he had for her and protecting her and her kids, their kids. And so that was sort of a moment where I went, and that's what happens when you tap dance with Fred Astaire. You just look good. You know, it was a, it, it didn't come off corny or silly. And then the same thing happened with Liam and I, which was our first scene together, was when we went into the monkey house the first time, just the two of us. Monkey. 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 I asked him actually on my close-ups, I was like, please don't look at me when you say monkey. I can't. <laughs> That's my accent. That's terrible. What can I tell you? I, Where I, I'm from. I just would start laughing and then crying. <laughs> I, I couldn't recover. Oh, it was just so funny. But for us, it was that um, that first. So Liam and I were in the very first. Um, they weren't actually Raycal suits. They were those paper suits. Yeah, we were right? under the impression there was not going. We didn't. We didn't worry about them because <laughs> they were just paper, like those forensic yeah. suits that the cops want. We thought that'll be grand. The other two are the difficult ones. <laughs> and then we put them on, and then we put the thing on. It. It was just. But being with someone who's funny and good and he sort of led the way for me when i'm supposed to really be in charge here <laughs> i was so grateful for that first journey into the monkey house with liam because he really took over and allowed me to just follow his i was grabbing onto his coattails i i was i was she's panicking. being she's being no, too modest she's not that. like that this lady is very much a leader and um and uh, it, it it was a joy this the, 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 Juliana that led the team in every way. She she runs a fantastic floor on a set. There's no ego at work. It's all about the product. It's all about the story, and it's all about the quality of it. And and it, it it's it's a complete and utter joy to to be sharing an acting space with this lady. And um, but there wasn't a day. It was really serious subject. It's death. It's horrible. And it's all. A, there wasn't a day that we didn't laugh. We didn't laugh too much. Uh, we laughed at all the time. And I remember when we put on those white suits when they were on, and I noticed I could hear my my sweat bubbling because it was boiling. And I remember <laughs> looking dripping. around, and God, I was dripping from my nose. And I said, "I thought these suits were supposed to be okay. They were breathable or something." And she went, "It's me." We all thought we were. I, I thought I was going into menopause. <laughs> I thought there's some truth in this male menopause stuff. I must be. I'm drowning in my own sweat here. You but, were uh, dripping. <laughs> that was horrible. I thought I was having yeah, a stroke. I kept looking going, no, you look fine. You look great, I think. <laughs> 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 I 
It was nuts. But when you've got those kind of difficulties and those long days and those suits, but hold on, let me tell you about this hero. That so that, the the white suit we wore was kind of sweaty and whatever. The orange suit that you saw in this was noisy and difficult to hear the cues. Then what came the monster, which I thank God didn't have to wear. What was those suit called? The blue one. Uh, um, hazmat suits. The full hazmat. That's the full what rubber weight, hazmat suit. What weight suit. was that? Fifty pounds. And you're strapped in. It's it's uh, I I. Mm. Tell yeah, them that was hard. Well, yeah. Well, so they're made for men. <laughs> by men as well. So by men, fast. made for men, by men. Um, so what you have to understand with fifty pounds is that on a man. So you know, on these guys, it would come. The weight of it is here, but on on me, the weight was here. And so when I'm in the lab lifting anything, a pen, I'm lifting up 50 pounds um, all the time. Plus the two fans that are built into the suit, which on a man would probably be down here, on me was right in my shoulder blades, like that. So if I went like this, I'd, ha I'd have <laughs> bruises. It, I mean, I'm making it sound awful. It was awful. Um, <laughs> And, and then on top of it, I realized I'm claustrophobic. So I did cry on camera three times when I wasn't supposed to. Um, but apparently, because I was in the decontamination chamber, <laughs> no one saw because there was water pouring all over me. So they were able to use the shot. Um, but I literally stood there and just sobbed. It was just a nightmare. So I can guarantee you, I don't care who's shooting the movie. <laughs> I will never, ever be in a hazmat suit again. <laughs> Noah, how about you? Oh, I think they covered it pretty well. I mean, the first, that, that scene with Juliana is a scene I knew, as I touched upon, you know, this is going to work. I got a great dance partner. This is amazing. And with Liam, it was a similar thing. I remember, I think, comes to mind once. We had a bunch of different, coming later in the show you haven't seen yet, but there was one night where we had a really long, complicated shot with a bunch of actors, and we were giving speeches and walking around, and the camera's snaking through, and it's a one-shot thing, and it goes on forever, and... There's just a, there's an un, it's the unspoken understanding that we have each other's back. There's an intuitive, just an immediate chemical sense of like that I find I, my reaction to working with other actors. I had it with Liam immediately. I remember meeting him for the very first time on just a base camp, and I was like, "How's it going? Pretty good. How you doing? Good." And you just there's an immediate sense like we we speak the same language. We're here about the work. This is no bullshit. This is no ego. This is, we're here to, to, to help each other, to serve each other, to serve the material. And it was an intuitive sense that, that came to fruition throughout the, throughout the difficulties of the shoot, that you know you can trust your partner, you can help each other, they're gonna help you, and you're just in, in the hands of a, of, a, of a pro, which is what makes you comfortable and relaxed and available for the work. And, and it makes it, I think it also make, makes you uh, 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 allow mistakes because right. it's not an ego thing, isn't it? You have a go with something, and even if it's like the stupidest idea you've ever had, right. there's nobody kind of judging you on it. You can have a smile, or you can look the, look to the, these two people that you trust implicitly, and they look at you like over their glass or whatever it may be. Go, Are you really going to be doing that? <laughs> and I go, all right, all right, we're just trying something. <laughs> And there's a real comfort in that because it makes you try a little harder and, and you don't mind making mistakes because you're not being judged and, it, and it's, a, it's a nice thing. And then you can kind of play tennis. You can, somebody else can try it and, and, and the person with the best idea in the room wins. And I, and I think that's really important. That makes the, the, the days go really quickly and are enjoyable. And I think that's important, that stuff. Yeah. All right, so when you think back over your career in acting, what would you say is the best advice you've been given over the years, and how have you applied it? Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a story that I, I believe that Richard Gere, when he was pumping gas in, 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 in L.A., and Peter Falk, remember Columbo, oh, of course, yeah. pulled in on the car, and uh, apparently Richard Gere said to, said to Peter, who was you know, Columbo and all sorts of wonderful, wonderful stuff, said, do you have any advice for a, for a young actor? And Falk said, Peter Falk said to him, uh, you got you got to remember, kid. They're not as smart as you think they are. <laughs> and and basically, there, there's a lot to be said in that sentence. Is that I I think what he was saying was, your opinion and your um, ideas are as good uh, as anybody else's is. Nobody has a has a monopoly on on intelligence or wisdom or creativity or anything like that. You're a contributor to things. You're not better or worse or, or, or you know whatever it may be. If you're bringing it and you're allowed to express yourself, 
um, what you're doing is your time and is your contribution. You're as entitled to be there as anybody else. Yeah, in line with that, I think it's a, it's it's really critical. You know, actors, and I didn't I didn't learn this until I, I made the, all these mistakes. But you know, when you're beginning in the field, you're desperate for any opportunity to work. So there's this feeling of powerlessness. There's a feeling of desperation that you have into, inherently to the position of an actor walking in, standing in line for an open call for an audition with 400 people, and you get your two minutes. And there's this, and it's really, really important to do what. Peter Fox said, which is hold on to your power, hold on to your belief in yourself. You're not a beggar and you're not desperate. You don't have a job in this moment, but you're, that, that opportunity will unfold. But don't give away your power it, it, to yourself. I don't mean you'd have, you don't have to be arrogant or obnoxious or you, know, you don't have to be swinging around showing how strong you are, but don't give it away. Don't ever feel like you need someone else to help you be who you are. You are who you are, always, and people will see it the longer you are who you are. Yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think um, I had such a great training ground with ER because I started ER at 25 and had never really been on a TV set much. But I had a great teacher, and I, or maybe I just listened and learned and watched. Um, but I chose to watch George Clooney. Um, why not? But I... I <laughs> That must bit. have been real difficult for you. <laughs> that was hard. No, because he had done 14 failed pilots. Wow. When we did the pilot of ER, um, and it was a, a, such camaraderie on the set in the beginning, and, and I knew this guy had been around enough sets to understand um, that I should watch what he does. Because I loved how he comported himself on a set. And I learned all my set etiquette from him. And the reason I think this relates to acting uh, actually maybe one of the most important things is that I do my best work when I feel safe when I'm in a safe environment what Liam was talking about so um, everyone not just the actors but from the PAs who are bringing water to the focus puller to the boom the boom um, operator to the cameraman every single job on the set is important and it's the only reason it all works, right? We can't do it without each other. And so no one's more important. I, my, my hairs go up on the back of my neck when I see an actor walk onto a set and not acknowledge the crew and say good morning. I get nervous, it makes me queasy because that crew is who I'm actually acting for in that moment. And I need to feel as comfortable and as safe as possible to give my best performance. So when you get to work with actors you love and a crew you feel safe with, and the crew feels respected by you, you make great work. Um, and, and I always say, I, I teach sometimes these little classes at universities now and then, and I always say to my students, because I don't think they teach you this in acting school. They teach you technique, they teach you plays, they teach you speech and body and all that, but they don't teach you how to be a professional actor on a set. And I, I always say to my, my students, be on time, be respectful, learn your lines, you are a paid professional. And when you get on that set, to make sure you can do your best work, treat everyone as you would want to be treated. Love that. That's amazing. Okay, lastly, um, we had some questions from the audience, and there's one in particular that I think would be great for all of you to address. Um, how, when you think back in between your projects before you knew the next one was coming, for you, ER to the good wife, good wife to now, how do you stay motivated? How do you stay optimistic and trust that everything is going to work out accordingly? Well, I'm, I'm in a kind of a peculiar position because I, I didn't start doing this until I was 29. Uh, and I discovered, uh, I, I, I took up acting not as any sort of career move because I didn't like the job I was doing and I wanted a distraction. Uh, and I love TVs and love it. And I wanted to find out how these people did this thing. And I didn't realize it would turn into heroin. I just, I just completely fell in love with it. Uh, and I, I, I've tried as much as I can. There's a million distractions. There's, there's, there's large checks, there's, there's working on blockbusters, there's all these, these sort of things, if you're lucky enough to point yourself in that position. 
the, 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 the most important thing for me was making sure that I didn't lose the love of the process. And when I was reading Shakespeare, when I didn't understand two words of what this speech was, was digging and digging and digging. And then when you something made sense, it was like a, a, a tiny little light went off. And was, oh, that's beautiful. That sounds beautiful. I know what he means. And it's written like poetry. And then the next line would feed that. And I was just, I had a voracious appetite for it. And it's, and it's uh, the solving problems on a set is when, when something that runs from a piece of ink on a piece of paper uh, to being lifted up uh, and, and to being made... Um, uh, uh, a believable tear-stained scene between two lovers who are never going to see each other again and to, and to get that and, and not to be condescending or pat patronising to an audience and make that the truth and bring those people along on that journey with you it is the greatest, greatest privilege on the planet and, it, yeah, and if you lose that and it's easy to lose it with, with the fame, the fortune and all that sort of stuff you're in the wilderness, you're gone and you've lost your reason for doing it and you've lost your love of doing it never lose the love of, of, of doing this job because it's an incredible honour and it's a real privilege Bravo, well said yeah. Yeah, very well said. Ditto <laughs> <laughs> What he said, drop the mic <laughs> <laughs> And Noah, love you more uh, uh, I've, I've lost the question. I got so inspired and moved. I'm, I'm done. How you stay motivated? Stay between motivated. In well, uh, oh, oh, uh, uh, not, not, not give in to the all-encompassing fear and gloom of never working again. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure how to do that. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, look, you have to, like, well, Liam said it great. Uh, Stay connected to why you're doing what you're doing. That, 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 the literature doesn't go away. Your passion doesn't go away. Your interest doesn't go away. That's persistent and continuous throughout, hopefully. If it's not, that's something else to examine. But so, so that fire that is your driving fire, which is the passion and the commitment and the interest and the curiosity about the work, you don't need someone to give you a job to have that be alive. Um, and in terms of the more practical, just logistical, you know, putting food on the table, paying your rent, uh, it's faith, you know, it's faith. It's, 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 it's bird's eye perspective. It's not getting caught up in the minute to minute. The minute to minute will kill you. But if you look backwards and go, hey, you know, it's been five years, I've paid my rent, I've been working. Great, if I haven't been working enough as an actor, I've been doing something else, but I'm still, I'm still acting, I'm still, in the, I'm still in the art. I'm still working on my craft. I'm still reading, I'm still living. I know someone I was teaching, a, Sometimes I, I, I teach as well a little bit. I was teaching a class last week of high school kids in New York, and uh, they were saying, you know, what, how do you do it? What do you do to become an actor? Like, what's the right, what do you do when you're not working? And I say, you need to live. Living is as important. Like, you can't live your life to be an actor. You have to live your life and then be an actor. You know, if, because you, the experiences you're having living a life, experiencing the wonders of the world, the wonders of human relations, those things need to be, primal and fundamental and they can't be they, they need to be for themselves then you bring that experience to your work but living for your work i think is an error if it's if it's all consuming all the time then you're you're not giving yourself the opportunity to experience life as a human which is what the most important homework for an actor is is to be as human as possible and that you can always do i i, I beautifully i mean Need I say more? I I do. I en I enjoy my my downtime because of that. I I live in New York, and one of the things I love to do um, is ride the subway. I know this sounds ridiculous, but I love seeing how people react and dress and act on a train. It's my it's my canvas that I get to fill in by what I see. So, and I walk everywhere in New York City. I, if it's 44 blocks, I'll just leave an extra 15 minutes early because I, I just want to see how people live. And um, my sister and I used to play this game um, where we would get on the bus going down Matt Fifth Avenue and we weren't allowed to look at the faces. We could only look at people's shoes and then we would have to guess what they looked like. <laughs> <laughs> just from their shoes and I still do that I do it because it informs you about who that person is right by their shoes or you start the other way and you look at their head and you say I know what kind of shoes she's wearing uh, you know and it 
this is what I need in order to form characters, in order to create my next, whoever I'm going to play next. I need constant human contact. And for me, living in New York City gives me that. Um, I, I mean, you like it or not. whether you like it or not, <laughs> exactly. Also, acting is reacting, right? So I always think, I, I get jealous of characters I play because I wish I could react the way they do. I miss playing Alicia Florek because she reacted every way I want to and never do. <laughs> um, and so I use it out on the street or in the subway. You know, if someone pushes me or if someone gives me a nasty look, I think, watch your reaction. If you were a different character, how would you be reacting? If you're Juliet, you know, some, and sometimes I forget and I just say, hey, fuck you and, you know, keep going or whatever it is. But it's, this is, we play human beings, right? That's our job. And so in my downtime, um, I love grabbing it and, and looking at it and seeing it. And when I, when for seven years it was so rare that I got to be outside. <laughs> on the street because I was just always in the studio or then running home and learning lines that I, I, lost, um, I lost that ability to feel connected to life that way. And I need that as an actor. It's why I didn't do, you know, um, I left ER after living here for six years because I, there were many reasons, but, but the main reason was I was drowning in not being amongst my people because you're living a bubble in your car and I'm, I'm from a place where a I need yeah. I need that kind of stimulation. So I think that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to thank all of you, especially all of you for watching the screening. Um, you can catch the rest of the series on Nat Geo. And please once again thank the amazing cast of the Hot Zone. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>